My full name is David Ames Songless, and my date of birth is July 6, 1934. Okay. We're going to come back later on and talk about where you were born and places you've lived and a lot of other things. But for right now, can you tell me the name of your father? My father's name was Wilburn Russell Songless. Do you know... Uh, well, we'll come back to him in a minute. Do you know his father's name? His father's name was Dero, S-D-E-R-O, Asthenix, A-S-T-H-E-N-I-X. Dero Asthenix Saunders. Good. And Mr. Dero Saunders' wife name? Her name was Grozy, G-R-O-S-I-E. Rosie, I, I don't know what her maiden name was. Okay, that's okay. So those would have been your grandparents on your father's side. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about your father. Well, first of all, do you know what your, your grandfather did, Mr. D. Rowe? Uh, he, was a, he was a farmer, and uh, he made, he made uh, a good bit of money just trading. He was a shrewd trader. Okay. And uh, he, I, I don't know what other business he had other than the fact that uh, that uh, that he, uh, I, I think he was just a farmer mostly. Okay. Where did he live? Uh, he lived in Starkville. Uh, on uh, on Main Street uh, in Starkville, up close to the to the railroad bridge that uh, that goes across to go into the college. And did he he lived on a farm? Uh, I'm not sure where he lived. He he lived. He passed away years before I was born. So, oh, okay. So I, I, don't, I don't know too much about him. Okay. So. Um, you, do you know what crops he farmed? No. And you don't know, know probably, probably what he traded? Probably in uh, beef cattle, I would think. Okay, all right. Do you know if you have any pictures of him or his I wife? don't have any pictures of him or his wife. Okay, and I think you told me the reason is you were the youngest child in your family? That's correct. Okay. Are your other brothers and sisters deceased now? Yes, but I have a picture of them here. My brother was, he's the oldest, and uh, he was uh, Wilburn Russell Saunders Jr. And my oldest of the two sisters, uh, my, my oldest sister was uh, Grozy Heath Saunders, and she married uh, B uh, Bill, Pat uh, Bill Holland. Rosie Heath, Patterson, Rosie Heath, Saunders, Holland. And then my younger sister was Alti, A L T I E, Alti. She was named, had the same name that my mother had. And she married uh, a fellow by the name of Patterson. Okay. And where did your brothers and sisters live? Well, my, uh, the Holland. The Holland, Rosa Heath and Bill Holland lived in, lived in uh, uh, Louisiana. And, uh, and my younger sister, Alte, and her husband lived in Oxford, Mississippi. Okay, all right. And so let's talk about your father for just a moment. Mm -hmm. Where was it that he lived? He lived, uh, 
on Greensboro Street in Starkville, Mississippi. And do you know just approximately his year of birth and date of death, approximately? No. Okay, we can look that up. But let's go back to your earliest memories of him. Uh -huh. How old would you say you were when you first remembered your father? Six, seven, eight, ten? Well, I, I remember my father. Uh, he, uh, he, he was alive when I was born. Uh, and so I guess, you know, childhood memories of, of him. Okay. During your childhood, uh, did he have the same profession? Yes. What was that? He was a dairy farmer. All right. And I think you've spoken to me about that before. So he would have raised dairy cows? Yes. Brown Swiss dairy cows. Brown Swiss. Mm -hmm. Now, was that a special type of dairy cow, uh, cow back in that day? Mm -hmm. Well, it was just a good dairy cow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think this period we're talking about would have been in the 1940s or 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, That's correct. Do you know how many cows he had, typically? Uh, about 40. Okay. Uh, we milked about 40 a day. So I'm thinking that would have kept you and your brother and your sisters pretty busy helping out with that, huh? Well, I, we, did, we didn't help out much. <laughs> and I don't think the sisters helped out any at all on the <laughs> farm because uh, the farm was about a mile out in the country. We all lived in town on Greensboro Street, but the farm was out in, about a mile away, uh, about two miles away out in the country. But you're not going to tell me you're the son of a dairy farmer and you don't know how to milk cows. Oh, I know how to milk cows. In oh. fact, my, my degree in college is in dairy production. That's right, and we want to talk about that pretty soon. But, so, you said that y'all Y'all lived back in town, and he worked out at his dairy farm a few miles outside of town. Is mm -hmm. that right? Okay. Okay. He went out to milk in the morning, and then and then left again, and went out to milk in the afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Now, back in that day, did they have milking machines, or did he have? To yes, them? they, they did milk. have them. Okay. It was a grade A, grade A dairy. Okay. Oh, uh, now your. Your mother's name was Addie Reynolds Saunders? Alti, A-L-T-I, Alti okay. Reynolds Saunders. Yeah, and... Um, now I have a picture of her. Okay, I'll, I will put that in, in your story. Um, so, your mom was a pretty much homemaker all her life. Yes. Do you ever remember her working a job at all for no, pay? She, she had no, no, no job that I ever knew of. Okay, all just, right. Just a housewife. And how long were her and your father married? Mm. I, I, don't, I don't know. They, they married until, you know, until uh, to, to he died. Okay. Did your mother sing? Uh, no. Did your father? My father sang. He sang. He was a soloist. Mm -hmm. All right. And where did he sing? In churches, you know. Uh, just, you know, at, at church. You, she, that, that's the only place I ever knew that he did, but he did sing in church. When y'all were growing up, what was the main church that you went to? Uh, the Star Wolf United Methodist Church. Okay. So pretty much all your years at home, you were in that church? That's right. Okay. And your dad sang in the choir there? Mm, not during my lifetime, but uh, perhaps earlier he must have. Right, because you were the youngest child and they had right. grown a little older then. Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever hear your father sing? Mm, no. Okay. And let's just skip a little bit away from your mom and your father now and and go to your early childhood and the first thing that i, I want to know is when did you first sing and where uh my first my first solo was uh, i was uh four years old 
and I sang at the uh, Starkville High School, and I sang a tisket and a tasket. Okay, and why would you have been singing there? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, somebody invited me to come or, or somebody brought me up there to, to do it. I don't know. Well, somebody must have known that you were a pretty good singer at that age. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but that, that, that's the only, that's the earliest one I remember. Okay. What's the next one that you remember singing? Oh, well, uh, of course, uh, after... After I was grown and married, I sang at the Decatur Civic Chorus in uh, Atlanta for uh, many years. You know, okay. before we moved uh, moved away. We'll we'll come back to that. But do you remember in high school any times you sang in church or anywhere? Oh yes, I sang in. Uh, in the, I was in the choir at, uh, in Starkville. Uh, at, at, you know, during my teenage and. Uh, uh, college years while I, while we lived in Starville, yeah. So did your church, do you remember if it had a junior choir, a children's choir? No, I don't think it did. Okay, so you started singing probably when you were a teenager at Starkville and United Methodist. Yes. Okay, and what year were you born? 34. Okay, so you probably were singing in that choir, I would say um, about 1950. About that time. Yeah, probably. Yeah. You'd be 15 or 16 years old. Okay. Now, after that, do you remember specifically where the next public place was that you sang? Mm. Well, I've sang in choirs. Every, every place we've moved since, you know, my whole life, when uh, we've lived all over the world, uh, I've and been at, at church in each one of those places. I've sung in the choir at each one of those places. Okay. What kind of a voice do you have, by the way? Oh, uh, baritone. Baritone. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll come back and talk a little more about the places that you sang later on. But for now, I think uh, I want to ask just a few more questions about high school. So when you're in high school... Do you remember any specific subject that you liked better than anything else? Mm, not particularly. I, uh, well, plain geometry, I think that was one of my favorite subjects. Okay. And that's a hard course for, mo for most people. Um, did you have any special interest in high school? Did you, were you in campus politics or, no. or did you play any sports? I played football. Okay. What position? Uh, right guard. And did you start? Yes. What years? Uh, this was probably... Hmm. I mean, junior, senior? Or... Well, I graduated in 51, so uh, probably 49. All right. So you played you as your sophomore, junior, and senior. Mm -hmm. As a, a right guard, you said? Yeah. Okay. And... Do you remember how much you weighed back then? Mm, a lot less than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> probably about 100, 150 pounds, okay. 150 or 60 pounds. That's a pretty good, pretty good uh, weight. Um, do you know, remember the classification of the school, whether it was 5A, 6A, or anything like that? Whether it was what? Whether it was like a 5A school or 6A or... They classify schools now according to the number of students in the classifications. Well, like I, I don't have any idea okay. about those classifications. Was it a large school, small school? Well, I don't know. We had uh, we had about uh, fifty people at graduation, so yeah, in the senior class. So that's about the size of it. Was it one of the main schools in Starkville? It was the only. It was the only high school in Starkville. Starkville was a small town. Well, but it's a well-known town. I, I think that probably was a little larger school than you, you remembered. Um, did you play any other sports besides no. football? Mm -hmm. um, did you have any kind of academic offers for college? 
no academic offers. I went, I went to college, but I didn't have any offers. When you were in high school, were you in the who's who or anything like that? No. You didn't know in your wife back then? Okay. So, I think, I think that kind of covers... Because when I was in high school, she was in grammar school. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get to a funny story on that. Okay, that concludes our discussion of your early years and your high school years. What was the address where you and your family lived when you were in high school and junior high school? 513 Greensboro Street, Starkville, Mississippi. Okay, was that close to the downtown area? Mm, well, it was fairly close, I, you know, maybe a mile from the main main part of town. Do you have a car in high school? A what? A car. Uh, no. Okay. So, why did you decide to go to, was it Mississippi State? Mm-hmm. Why did you want to go there? Well, it was right down the street. <laughs> okay. It's, it's Starkville's the hometown of Mississippi State. Well, I thought it might have something to do with the, the field, of the academics that you studied, but I understand. Um, so, did you live at home with your parents all four years? Yes. Okay. And what did you major in? Dairy production. What was your minor? Didn't have a minor. Okay. And... Um, Let's see, you were, at that time in your life, what were you thinking that you were going to do for a career? Mm, I probably didn't think much about career at that time in my life. Okay, okay. So, I guess it was just probably understood that, uh, that I would tell you know, take over the farm when my father passed away, and I'd, I'd be a dairy farmer. That's why yeah. I studied, I studied uh, dairy production, but uh, that didn't come to pass. Right. Well, that's very good to know that. Though. I, we understand that better now. Were you in a social fraternity? I was a Kappa Sigma. Okay. Any particular reason why you signed with? I mean, pledged with that? Sorority, that fraternity, I'm sorry. No, they're the ones that asked me to join, and I did. Were there any boys that you knew from high school already in there? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Or well, maybe one, one or two, maybe. Okay. I don't recall which ones they were now. But uh, uh, Well, Kappa Sigma was a very good fraternity. Mm -hmm. So... Is there anything from your four years in college that you think is relevant or you remember anything special? Mm, I can't think of anything special. Okay, so you probably started taking ROTC when? Your junior year or before then? Uh, I don't remember. I, I think you start taking ROTC when you, when you first get there. I believe it's in the freshman year. Okay. And... Obviously, that held a lot to do with your profession later on in life, but do you remember that you liked ROTC? Yeah, it was okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, when you, your senior year, with your graduation coming up, what were your plans? Well, my, uh, I knew that, that uh, on graduation, I'd go into the, to the military, because that's, that's what everybody that went in ROTC did when they graduated. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I knew I'd be going into the service. What year did you finish college? Uh, 1955. Okay, so then, and you check me if I'm wrong on this, but we weren't involved in Vietnam yet. No, the, that was the Korean, that Korean was the war Korean. was going on then. Right. So where were you? the first year when you, you enlisted, I think you told me, as a second lieutenant? Uh, second lieutenant, mm -hmm. Okay. And where did you go for boot camp? Fort Hood, Texas. How'd you like that? Good place. 
Good, good. How long were you there? Uh, I was there for the duration of my two years. Okay. And, what, I mean, other than boot camp, what did you do there? Oh, well, we went to, uh, we, we, you know, you, you trained it. You trained to uh, to go overseas, but I didn't go overseas because I was a sole surviving son. And at, at, at that point in time, uh, my brother was killed in World War II. So, and, and I was the only, I was the sole surviving son and they didn't send sole surviving sons overseas. So uh, I, I went to Fort Hood, Texas and I stayed there. Okay, now that's very, very useful information. Um, I didn't realize that, but I understand now that in that in that era, when young men were graduating from college, then they could be drafted and could have to go to, to South mm -hmm. North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did not know that your older brother had died in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just uh, talk about that for just a moment and then get back to your story. But how was he killed? Uh, he was a prisoner of war. Uh, for for many years, uh, you know, two or three years before, and and uh, the Japanese were transporting the prisoners uh, on an unmarked Japanese ship for some reason, and uh, the ship was bombed and uh, and everybody on the ship was killed. Oh, that's very sad. Uh... I know that must have been terrible for your mother and your father. Very much so. And, and I, we have seen that picture of the four of you together, and, and your your older brother was, I, I think he might have had a, had a military uniform on in that picture, so I know that your parents were proud as they could be of him. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how he was captured? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. You were still pretty fairly young at that. Oh yeah, I was just a kid when he went overseas. Yeah. Yeah. Born in thirty four, and he left uh, when Pearl Harbor hit in what nineteen forty. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. So then, you were there at Fort Hood for four years, and then what happened? Mm. I mean the. I think that ended your military career. Didn't yeah, you? I got out of the service and came back to Starkville, Mississippi. Okay. And what did you do when you came back to work? Well, when I came back, uh, I started selling uh, insurance for uh, for a Farm Bureau. All right, and how, why did you do that? Why did you pick insurance? Well, actually, I didn't. Well, let, let's back up a little bit. When I first came back from from overseas, I I went I went into the uh, 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 hatching egg business uh, we, on, on our farm. We built some chicken houses, and I had about two thousand <clears throat> two thousand laying hens, and uh, we uh, we shipped uh, uh, hatching eggs to the to the uh, Place where they where they hatch them for 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 baby chicks <clears throat> for the broiler industry. So this would have been your father's dairy farm where he had started raising yeah. chickens. Also, that's right. It was a portion of the farm. Yeah. How many chicken houses did he have? Two. How did you like loading up chickens? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so he got paid then for for the for raising the chickens, and but he wasn't involved in. Well, he wasn't that. involved in any of that. This was this was my business was the chicken thing. Yeah. Oh, and how did that come about then? Oh, I just decided that's what I wanted to do. I don't I don't remember the details of how it, how it all how it all happened, but. Uh, that's so, just the way we did it. So your father had some land, and it would be on his land that he gave you to build the chicken houses. Mm -hmm. But you evidently had some experience raising chickens. Well, not before that, uh, but uh, 
you know, the chicken's not hard to raise. All you got to do is feed it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting, though. Mm -hmm. uh, you were out of the army. Mm -hmm. You needed something to do. Right. And I'm I'm willing to bet that your father probably helped you pay for the chicken houses, and the feed and everything to begin with. But then you started making a pretty good profit off of it, I imagine. Yeah, and we we paid for, for the houses and everything, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So how long did that last? That lasted about a uh, hmm, couple of years, 55 to 57. And uh, then uh, I got married. And okay. we moved to Columbus, Mississippi. Right. We're going to talk about your marriage shortly, but uh, to get the time frame right, uh, you came back home from college. Uh, what year was it? 15? I graduated from college in 55, was in the Army from 55 to 57. 15. Okay. And from 57, we... Uh, uh, you started the chicken house. Chicken child business. You had that for a couple of years. Yeah. And then after a couple of years with the, the chickens, mm -hmm. you you went to work for a farm bureau? Yes, after I got married. Oh, that was after you got married. Okay. Then we moved to Columbus, Mississippi. Right. We're gonna we're gonna talk about it, all that for now, but I mean in a minute. But mm -hmm. for now you were you were back home, you had a couple of chicken houses. Uh, you ran them for a couple of years, and then did you sell those chicken houses when you went to work for Farm Bureau? No, the chicken houses were still on the farm. At that point in time, my father was still farming. We still had the dairy farm, so. Okay. So we talked about your high school years and talked about a little stint in the military, and you came home to Starkville. You raised chickens for a couple of years, and did you go to work at Farm Bureau before you met Ann or after? Uh, this was after. Okay, so let's let's go back, um, and let me ask you. Then you were still running your chicken houses when you met Ann. Mm -hmm. So she took a chance on a boy who owned a chicken house. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> okay. All right. So I've heard this story before, but tell me tell me how you met your wife. Uh, well, the first time I, I met her was, the uh, first time I saw her was in church, in the, at the Methodist church. And she she was sitting in the, in the uh, congregation, and she had a, she had a, a, a hat that looked like a lampshade. No. <laughs> 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 and I asked, I asked the, the guy in the choir next to him, I said, who is that girl with that lampshade hat on her head? <laughs> and he told me who she was. And uh, I, I asked around and, uh, and uh, found out that who she was. And, and, I, and I met her and uh, asked her out. Okay. And, don't, well, don't go into that story <laughs> yet, okay? Let me ask you some specific questions. Okay. Okay. So what was she doing at, in church that day? Was that her family's church? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, so you had gone off to college in the military and you hadn't been to that church so often. And that's that's right. why you didn't know her. She was six years younger than you. That's right. Okay, so do you remember the name of that buddy who told you who she was? Pat McInvale. Pat McInvale, <laughs> okay. So uh, tell me a little bit about Pat, was he? High school friend? Uh, he was he was a little younger than me, but he was in the choir with at the same time I was. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, one of your choir buddies. All right. Mm -hmm. And so you just had to know who the girl that girl was. Yeah. Now, how how did it come about that you asked her for a date? Uh, she was invited. She must have been invited because she was she was at a party about three doors down the street from a, a family that had a, a, a daughter about her age. And uh, when I was riding past, on the street past that house, I, I saw her and her friends out in the yard. So I stopped and uh, got out of the car and went over and, 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 and uh, introduced myself to her. And, 
and uh, that's 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 how we got that's how I, was, I met her okay and then where did it go from there well I asked her for a date and she accepted and uh, we, we we started we started dating so was it there's something special about that first date uh, well yeah uh, we we went to, we, we went out to, to a movie I think it was that night and uh, yeah we went to a movie that night okay I thought you had mentioned that in the poem that you that you wrote for her but uh, oh yeah uh, oh, you, do you want me to uh, do you want me to recite that well <laughs> the no, incident <laughs> no we've already uh, yeah you've we've got already got that so then while you were dating her you started working at Farm Bureau, is that right? Yeah. Well, when 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 I was dating her, I was I was working at uh, was I was dating I was a chicken farmer, and uh, her father was a Farm Bureau agent in Starkville, Mississippi. Ah. Okay. And uh, so uh, I got I got a job uh, as as. Uh, as a farm bureau agent in Columbus, Mississippi, which is just about 20 miles down the road. And so uh, when, when we got married, uh, we moved to, uh, to Columbus, because uh, I, uh, and, uh, and then her father became ill and uh, had to go into the hospital and was, was had to go to the sanatorium for a while, for a year. And uh, so Ann uh, became the Farm Bureau agent in Starkville for her father. And uh, so she was then the Farm Bureau agent in Starkville and I was the Farm Bureau agent in Columbus. And uh, and that occurred until her father came back, and then when her father came back, and uh, uh, she came back, you know, she she was no longer a farm bureau agent then. Okay, so just for some clarification, um, back then people could go into a sanatorium for things like tuberculosis. Or, tuberculosis, yes, or, that's what he had. Oh, is that what? Okay, so he was very sick for about a year, mm -hmm. and when you. How far did you say Columbus was from Starkville? About 20 miles. Oh, okay. So y'all didn't have any trouble no. um, with that. So what happened then after that year, after he came back? What did you and Ann do? Uh, well, uh, then uh, uh, I got a job. I got a, a, an interview for for a job in, uh, to, to be uh, a... Uh, uh, hold on just a minute. Take your time. Take your time. Uh, I got an interview for a job f to be uh, 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 in the, the uh, uh, Corps, of uh, Engineers? Corps of Engineers. And uh, so uh, I and they offered me the job in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and so Ann and I moved then to Vicksburg, Mississippi. What was the job? Uh, the job was uh, in uh, in uh, uh, public relations, uh, a, a civilian personnel job. Okay, so when you say a civilian personnel job, were you were you involved in hiring? For the hiring and firing, yes, it was personnel office in the personnel office in Vicksburg. Okay. All right. Are you checking your notes? You yeah, we were there from sixty. We were there from sixty-three to sixty-eight. Okay. Nineteen sixty-three to sixty-eight. 
Did Ann ever go to college there in Starkville? Yeah, she went to Mississippi State, but she didn't graduate. She she was there for a couple. She she spent she spent about two years in college. Okay, all right. So then, how long? Okay, okay. you you were only in Vicksburg for two, no, for seven years, six years. Okay. Yeah, we were in Vicksburg from from sixty uh, sixty three to sixty eight, and then we moved to Hawaii. Now you were. You had a civilian job with the Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. You were totally out of the military. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what was the reason that you that you moved to Hawaii of all places? I got a job offer uh, in Hawaii with uh, with the military as a civilian with the military, and. Uh, that's why I moved to Hawaii, and we were there from 68 to 71. Was it still with the Corps of Engineers? No, this was with the uh, U.S. Army Hawaii. Okay, and what was your job? Civilian personnel. So it's similar to what you were doing yeah. with the Corps of Engineers. Okay. All right, so you lived in Hawaii for about three years mm -hmm. uh, on Waikiki. Yeah, we lived, well, we lived in Kailua, which is... Uh, uh, across across the uh, the island, uh, yeah. Oahu yeah. from uh, yeah. I bet Anne did not hate living there, did she? No, she liked it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't too impressed with the job, but uh, oh, okay. it was a good place to live. So the climate was especially nice. So I don't know specifically about that island, but why was it that you went to work at Kalua instead of uh, Honolulu? Well, Kailua. I worked in I worked in Honolulu, but we lived in Kailua, which is across the across the, the mountain range. Hawaii, the island of of Oahu, which is the island we lived on, is divided by a, a mountain range, and uh -huh. you, and yeah, and we lived on the other side of the mountain in in uh, in another town. Okay. But but I commuted every day. Okay. Back. Now, in a minute, we're going to talk about. You move into Nashville, but first, is there anything you remember about living in Hawaii that was a great thing? Did y'all like to go out to eat, or did you go to the other islands? We visited the other islands. In fact, we visited uh, uh, the Big Island, which is the island of Hawaii, and uh, that's where the volcano is. Yeah, and it was it's it's still an active volcano. Did you go to Maui? Yeah, we went to Maui. Okay. Do you remember a place called the Pioneer Inn? No. That's a little, just a little tidbit of history that I know about Maui. <laughs> I went there once myself. Okay, so just to get a little perspective on what's going on. You were, you were out of college, then you were in the military for two or three years, went home for two or three years, met in. You all worked for two, just roughly. Then you moved to Hawaii. Uh -huh. Wow. So you would have been probably at this time, let's see, 1968. You were born in 1934. 34. So you would have been 34 years old. Yeah. And Ann was 28. Yeah. That had to be great at that age. Yeah, it was. You were young. You were in love. You, no children had appeared by then. Right. right. <laughs> Okay, so I know y'all are having a great time, and as always, making friends yeah. like everywhere that you you moved. So why then did you leave Hawaii to go to Nashville? I had a job offer, a promotion, ah. with uh, back with the Corps of Engineers, uh, oh. and uh, that we left there in seventy one and uh, stayed there until seventy three. From seventy one to seventy three, we were in Nashville. So the Corps wanted you back. Yeah. They knew, they had your history working for them. I guess. And probably knew a little about, about you in Hawaii. Okay. So what part of uh, Nashville did y'all live in? Uh, we lived in, uh, hmm. can't think of the street. If it doesn't yeah. come to you, just what part? Uh, suburbs? Uh, yeah, it was a suburb. North suburbs? Yeah. Okay. All right. 
And anything special you remember about Nashville? Uh, mm, not really. Ann hated it. It was not a good place for her. Of course, she left Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and it started off bad because when we got off the plane from Hawaii and, and, and unloaded in Nashville, it, it was sleeting us. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and David Jr. was small at the time, and he says, Pappy, my feet feel funny. And I looked down, and he didn't have any shoes on. <laughs> oh. Okay, David, so we were talking about you had got an offer while you're in Nashville to return to Okinawa. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's to go to Okinawa. Yeah, and that was for what? which job? That was a, a, a civilian personnel officer job with, uh, with, the, with the Army. The Corps of Engineers again. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that was in... What year? Uh, 73. 73. Okay. And so when you moved to Okinawa, Japan, mm -hmm. did you live on a military base? Yes. Okay. But I think you've uh, mentioned to me in a previous conversation that at this time, uh, you and you and Ann were able to tour, is it Indonesia quite a bit? Taiwan, Philippines, Hong Kong, Japan. Yes, we, we made some we made some short trips, uh, you know, to to some of those places. Yeah. All right, and I'm, I figure that David Jr. was in tow with you mm -hmm. for most of those. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's just go through. Well, let me ask you a general question. Mm -hmm. What was Okinawa like? Okinawa was a beautiful place. It's the southern prefecture of Japan, and uh, it's a beautiful island. And, and it, uh, uh, of course, most people know about Okinawa from the war, which uh, Second World War, but uh, that's been a long time ago now, and uh, it's the island has been completely revamped and. Uh, everything, everything's real, real beautiful there now. Great. So it was a pleasant place to mm -hmm. to live and you, and to work mm -hmm. and to work. You must have been making good money because to go the places that you said, you always had to fly there. Yes, but we were flying space uh, space available as uh, for military can fly space A. Ah, and uh, so. Uh, you, you go to the airport, and if they've got uh, two seats available, uh, you and Ann, me and Ann could get on a plane. I see now when you when you're able to go so so <laughs> many places. So let's talk about some of them. Do you remember anything about Taiwan? Uh, just that we went there and 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 spent you know spent spent the day or two there, and. Uh, I get we went just because we had never been there before, and all, I'd always heard about it, and we wanted to go and see how it was. So, okay, you know, it was a nice place and a good place to shop too, by the way. I, you know, I imagine just a little tidbit of information today in 2023, Taiwan has the largest computer semi-chip manufacturing facility hmm. in the world. Yeah, that's probably so. They yeah. are the, the world leader. Okay, what about the Philippines? The Philippines uh, is, is also a, a very beautiful place. And uh, one of the places that we visited in the Philippines was the, uh, was the World War II Memorial there. And uh, my, brother's, my brother's name is on the wall there as, as, as one of the people who passed away during the, during the service there. That's was correct. killed during the war. What branch of the service was he? He was an army. Okay, and when you say on the wall, what? It's a, it's a, it's a big. Uh, it, it, 
well, is, is this just got the names of the people that the names of the people that had that were killed in the war uh, in the Pacific? There, okay. it's kind of like the kind of like the Vietnam Wall that they've got now that you read about. Well, I think it's to know that Wilbur Wilburn R. Saunders Jr.'s okay. name is is there and will yes, be there a long is. time. And, you know, it's really special because as we speak today, this is Memorial Day weekend, and mm -hmm. that's, that's a nice thought. Okay, so I know there was something special about Hong Kong, and I think this is going to be a little funny. So tell me about your visit to Hong Kong. Well, our visit to Hong Kong, uh, is, is this the one on where we stayed? Uh, I think that might have been Thailand. That was Thailand, yeah, yeah, right. Hong Kong, you had a little incident I believe. Uh, oh, oh yes. Uh, that that's what we were. We rented a car, and we're driving around, and I, I accidentally crossed over into Red China. And, <laughs> <laughs> and after we realized what we had done, we quickly we quickly returned back uh, back across the line and back into Hong Kong, uh, for 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 fear that you know we'd be we'd be. Uh, Put in jail. Well, and, tell me, tell me why the Red Chinese uh, military would have had a special interest in you. Well, I had a top secret clearance, and uh, and they they would probably want to find out everything I I knew, <laughs> and uh, they have means of getting that information out of you, <laughs> and, and it's not pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in that regard, we haven't mentioned anything about your top secret clearance any of the other places that you live was was there was this something you had done in other parts of the world also in part of your career mm, no but uh it's it's just in, the, in when i was in the military uh uh i was in uh, you know uh, I, I was in positions where where you had to have a where you had to have a top secret clearance but why what kind of work did you do that would require that kind of a clearance. Well, uh, I can't really talk about okay. it. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. That's totally fine, and I understand. There are some some things that that people can mention about the kind of work if it were accounting or something like that. But I understand that there are different things. So let's move on. Um, you said I, in an earlier conversation that you went to Japan. And then I think you had a funny story about Thailand. Mm. Oh yes, we went to Thailand, and uh, uh, when uh, we were on the plane going to Thailand, we uh, we uh, there was a there was a soldier on the plane with us, and uh, he when he found out that 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 we were going to be there for a while, and uh, I asked him uh, if if there was a, a good place to stay. A hotel that he and, and he says yes you need to stay at the Swan Lake that's a good hotel and so we went to the Swan Lake and when we got in the cab and told the cab driver we were going to Swan Lake uh, when that's where we wanted to go he was kind of apprehensive about it and he questioned me about it and I, I didn't think too much about it but he took us anyway <laughs> And after we got there and it checked in and everything, we found out that uh, that actually Swan Lake is a house of ill repute. <laughs> <laughs> well, we spent the night there and uh, and uh, the food was very good. And uh, left the next morning. Uh, David Jr. was with us, and uh, I figured he he could he could brag to his friends where he'd spent the night. <laughs> <laughs> He'd spent the night in the whole house. <laughs> oh goodness! I imagine you would have, if you had known that in advance, you would have found another place to oh, stay. Oh yes, in. we that, would have. That's funny. Okay, so that was about a two-year stint there in Okinawa. Uh, is there anything else you recall about Okinawa that you'd like to mention? No, no, we. Uh... Uh, it, it was it was just a pleasant place. Uh, 
it was one of the places where I wanted to. They, they have a golf course that's just absolutely gorgeous, overlooking the ocean and uh, and everything. And uh, I, I wanted to learn how to play golf, and but but my job was so demanding that I never got, got a chance got a chance to do that. So and to this day, I, I've never played golf. So. Uh, <laughs> That's just the way life is, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>
to stay with me while, while we were there. And that's, and that's where we spent, we spent uh, from 80, 80, uh, from 89 to 95 when I retired, I retired in Panama. Okay, so I think I recall when you were thinking about going to Panama, uh, that it was a pretty significant decision and because of the greater pay raise and that would help you in your retirement. Mm -hmm. That would have been a joint decision between you and Anne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you, when, when, <clears throat> when you're married, as long as we'd been married, everything's a joint decision. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> That's why one plus one is equal to more than two. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, and you also said that the best place that we that we stayed, you thought, was Panama. Yeah, uh, that's because not only was it a was it a nice place, uh, but also uh, the people I worked with there were so nice. I, probably the the best group of folks that uh, that I had uh, uh, in in my career. I, I really did like every everybody that was there. Well, that's great, and we're going to come back and have another section of your, your biography on the friends that you and Anne have made, and we'll mention some of them then, but is there anything you want to add now about Panama and your stay there? Uh, well, it was it was fun to go down and watch the Queen Mary II come through the canal oh. because there was about six inches on each side of the ship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it went through the canal <laughs> and uh it was it was a tight squeeze but uh it was it, it, everybody would go down to watch to see what was going to happen <laughs> but uh that, that was fun to do all right so anything about panama that you loved any kind of recreation that you did travel mm. sports games anything no, we, uh, we we didn't travel much in in, in Panama. Uh, uh, mo mostly, we just stayed there. Okay. All right. Then, in a moment, we're going to talk about Gulf Shores. Okay. So, David. We've talked about um, Panama, and now we came to the the time of your life, I guess, when it was ready, you were ready to retire. Is that why you moved to Gulf Shores, because you're retiring? Yes. We had thought about coming to Gulf Shores before we had, had contemplated retirement uh, when we were in uh, Stone Mountain, but... Uh, uh, then the job opportunity came along, and that's that's where we changed our plans and went to Panama. But before we before we were we got the job offer, and and when we were thinking about retirement, while still in uh, while still in Stone Mountain, we had made a trip down here to Stone Mountain and to all of the the uh, Gulf all of the seashore places uh, on the Gulf, uh, towns on the Gulf from from uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, all the way down to St. Joe, uh, Florida, to looking at, at houses because we always wanted to live close to the ocean. And uh, uh, one of the places we stopped here was in Gulf Shores and we liked it very much. And uh, so uh, we we decided then when we got the job off, of course we went to Panama. But then when we got ready to retire in Panama, we knew we knew we wanted to come back to Gulf Shores. Okay, so your your reason for coming here to retire was a little different than most people. Most people have been here a lot in years prior to moving here. They vacationed here. Mm -hmm. um, but with you and Ann, I don't. It sounds like you didn't had not visited that much. Well, You're... well, we had been here. We had visited here, and uh, oh, okay. we had stayed at what, what at that time was the Ashwanda Motel out on the beach. Yes, and uh, there wasn't any condos here. That it was all all open o open sand, 
and uh, we stayed at the Ashwanda, and uh, we, we liked it here. So now that would have been, what, about 1995? Yeah, David Jr. was still small. He was still uh, still a small kid at that time. Okay, so I'm trying to remember when David Jr. was born. He was born in uh, 1965. Okay, so if he was, say, 15, that'd be 1980. Um, now, we're out of sequence here a little bit. Um, when you moved to Gulf Shores, I'm thinking it was sometime between 90 and 95, because you were in Panama in 1989. Well, I was in Panama from 89 to 95. All right. So you moved to Gulf Shores in 95 then. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So you, you mentioned something that I think has real significance. The Ashwanga Hotel, I think you spell that A-S-H-W-A-N-G-A? N-D-E-R, Ashwanda. Ashwanda, okay. And it was the only, in 1995, it was the only... Probably, probably the only hotel here. Was it close to what we call the hangout now? It was uh, where McDonald's was at uh, on the beach, uh, out, but it was out on the sand, yeah. Okay. I would say well, around probably the place where McDonald's is. Okay. And it seems like you had mentioned someone, a realtor, who had helped you a lot. That's right. Uh Yes, uh, we uh, uh, Lillian Bemis. Lillian Bemis was the uh, realtor that had shown us the houses while we were here on our previous journey. You know, when we were okay. thinking about retiring, when we were still in Stone Mountain, and uh, she kept up with us all that time when we were in Panama. We got I got birthday cards from her, and we got anniversary cards, and uh, she really. She really kept up. She was the only realtor that did. And so when we got ready to retire, we said, well, let's go back. Let's go back to Gulf Shores. And we did. And, and I'm glad. <laughs> I'm going to just read something into this and say that uh, realtors don't send cards and birthday cards to all their, all their clients. <laughs> but UNN had a long string of great relationships and friends. And I think Lillian Be Beavis. Bemis mm -hmm. just happened to be a good friend who wanted to keep yeah. up with you. Okay. All right. Any? Oh, we wanted wanted to talk about St. Andrews. So a year or two after you moved to Gulf Shores, well, you immediately joined United Methodist Church in Gulf Shores. Mm -hmm. That's right. But then a small group of people uh, left that church for some kind of reason and they started attending worship services on the beach. That's right. Can you tell me a little about that? Well, we we first started first started meeting on the beach, and then uh, then then we moved to a to a, a trailer that was uh, parked out uh, where St. Timothy where where St. Andrew is now. There was a trailer we met in the trailer for a while. And then, then after they got the church going, we met, uh, we we started, uh, you know, being in a church. Yeah. Now, when you were at uh, United Methodist Church, First United Methodist, I've got Shores. Did you sing in the choir there? Mm-hmm. Okay. And your uh, your choir director was a pretty significant friend, wasn't she? Very much so. Mm -hmm. And her name Joan was Joan A. David, we have talked about your parents and your grandparents and a lot of your friends. So I want to wrap up for now your your this part of your biography and talk about your children and your grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with um, we'll we'll start with with Deborah. She married and um, her last name or her married name was. Deborah Saunders Fowler, mm -hmm. and they had uh, two children, Christopher and Jennifer. And we talked before about how sad it was when you lost Deborah, and how 
difficult it was to get over that. But I think, you know, some of the poetry that you have written reflect that and yeah. uh, the grace that's involved in that situation also. Um, but let's talk about Christopher because Christopher, if I recall, lives pretty close by. He right? lives in Foley. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's about 30? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. Yeah, he's uh, he he he's working for one of the cell phone companies in Foley. Okay, all right. And he I don't think he's married yet, right? No. All right. And his sister Jennifer, mm -hmm. um, she married, mm -hmm. and her name is now Jennifer Lloyd Took. Mm -hmm. That's T O O K. That's right? correct. All right. And you had mentioned earlier that she moved to Branbury, England, and that she has three kids. She does. Why did she move to England? Uh, well, she had a job before before she got before she before she was married. Uh, uh, she got a job in uh, in Germany, and uh, she met uh, she met Daniel Took. While they were working in Germany, and he he was he was from England, but uh, he was in Germany at, at the time, and uh, they started dating, and uh, they got married, and uh, went back to England, and uh, when he got transferred back there, so she went with him, and uh, and they now have three, three three children: Ava, Stella, and Ezra. So Ava, Stella, and Ezra. Ezra, those are your three great grandchildren. That's correct. The only three great grandchildren I have. That's wonderful. Uh, are you as crazy about them as you were about your grandchildren? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's too bad you can't see them more often than you do. But that's right. They're I, far away. Yeah. Okay. So David Senior. You've told me a lot of good things, of, or some good things about David Senior. You, you've talked about how smart he is. So David Junior, you're talking. I, I'm sorry, I mean David Junior, <laughs> right? <laughs> David Junior. <laughs> okay. So, what what does he do? He's with a an automobile wheel company. Okay. They make specialized wheels for automobiles. Okay, and. Uh, where'd he go to school? University of Georgia. Oh my goodness. Okay. Met his wife there and she they both from the University of Georgia and are big Georgia fans. Oh that's great. That's great. So this is a this is heady heady times for Georgia fans because <laughs> in football they've won two national championships now. Yep. Okay, so they have uh Jordan who is about 22. Mm -hmm. and, and she's now engaged to be married and will be married in October. Really? Where at? Hmm? Where at? In what city? Well, she, she, she's living, she, she just graduated from college at University of Georgia. And uh -huh. they, they, li they live in, uh, they live in, uh, uh, out from, a, in a suburb of Atlanta. Right. Duluth or something? Yeah. Something like that. Okay. And Reagan? They've recently moved, and I can't think of the name of the town that they're saying, but it's on a uh, on lake, on uh, a lake like Lanier. Oh, okay. And how about Reagan? And Reagan is, uh, I think she's a junior or a senior at the University of Georgia this year. Okay. And uh, uh, she... Uh, Oh, she's the University of Georgia. Uh, okay. Jordan, Jordan, uh, was it uh, Georgia Southern? Georgia Southern, okay. Yeah. All right, so we had uh, their grandfather went to uh, Mississippi State mm -hmm. University in Starkville, okay, and then the grandfather's son, David, went to the University of Georgia. That's correct. And so Reagan 
his youngest daughter followed in mm -hmm. that path to the University of Georgia, and mm -hmm. Jordan went to Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern. Right. So now Jordan will be married soon, and you could be looking at more great gen grandchildren. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> well, we hope so. Okay. Anything you want to say about anyone else in your family for now? I think we've covered about everybody in the family. Uh, yeah. uh, I can't think of anybody okay. else. Well, you'll have an opportunity to say some things, special things to them later on. But you've done right. a very, very good job, and I appreciate it. And, okay. and we'll close this part now. Thank you, sir. David, you and Ann have had a lifetime of good friends. You've, you've had so many excellent friends in so many different places is what is re really interesting about you. I know that it, at this point it's going to be difficult for you to recall names and everything, but we're just going to run through some of the places that you've lived and maybe <laughs> a few will come to, to mind. So at one point... Early in your marriage, you were living in Columbus. Um, I don't think that would that was a situation though that was for employment. Yeah, and you right. weren't really there that long. Right. But after that, we, we'll move back to Starkville where you were actually married, and the pastor of the church there was Doctor Lott. Mm -hmm. And you you mentioned a couple of your the guys that were your in your wedding. What were their names? Uh, Watson Butts and uh, uh, D. Rowe Saunders. All right. And Watson was your... next. He was next door neighbor in, from the time I was born. So he was your best man. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, whatever happened to Watson? He's still still in... They, he and his wife uh, live in uh, 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 Long Beach, uh, Mississippi. Long Beach, okay. All right, how about Dero? Uh, he's passed away. Okay. All right, so then you moved to Vicksburg, and you had a couple of friends there. Uh, Richard and Phyllis Coward? Richard and Phyllis Coward, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And Good friends. What did they do? Uh, he was with the... Uh, with the uh, Internal Revenue Service. Uh, there's, a, there's a funny story about him, <laughs> if, if you'd like to hear it. Sure, sure. <laughs> he, he came on one day shaking his head, and he said, you're not gonna believe this. He says, we, we, we audited a, 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 a guy that has a local mom and pop grocery store, and uh, it, 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 he he had claimed that he was given about 80% of everything that he made uh, to charity, to the church. And uh, we we questioned, you know, that that large of a donation to the church was 80% of everything he made that year. And uh, so we, we, we did an audit on him, and he presented checks to the church. He showed that he had done all of this. So we went out to the church and talked to the pastor, and he says, oh, yeah, he says, every Sunday he gives us a check for all the money in the collection plate, and he uses it in his business. <laughs> <laughs> that's hard to believe, but I guess that's a true story. <laughs> that's a true story. <laughs> okay, you mentioned earlier Lena, Louis Reno. Louis Reno, yeah, he's he. I worked with Louis uh, in the in the uh, office there at uh, Corps of Engineers. There, he was a friend. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, then there was a couple of good friends, Boots and Buster Bass. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Boots uh, Buster has passed away now, but uh, Boots is still still living here in the Gulf Shores area. Okay. Do you remember what Buster did for a living? Uh, he he had a, a, a sewage business out uh, 
out on Fort Morgan Road. <laughs> All right, and I've never heard of anybody owning a sewage business. But <laughs> <laughs> did you? Well, 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 it's a big plant out there. <laughs> they process, I guess, is what they do. I don't, I don't know how how it works, uh, but he has a, he had that business. He started that business out there. Yeah, that's a very well known uh, landmark along Fort Morgan Road. Most most people don't know what it is. Okay, so we you moved to Kalua, Hawaii, for a short time, and then to Nashville. You had a couple of friends there, Janie and Harold. Janie and Harold, yeah, they were good friends, and. Uh, Harold has now passed away, but Jane is, uh, uh, I think, still alive. She's probably still alive, but I hadn't hadn't had any contact with her lately. Okay, and then Okinawa, and then Stone Mountain, and um, in Stone Mountain, you had a number of friends that were just spread out for different places. There was the pastor of the church there, and yeah, yeah. Uh, people in the choir was. Yeah, it's a requirement was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but now in Panama, Panama was one of the places that you described as one of the best places that you'd ever uh, lived. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounded kind of like it was a place where you and Ann had made really great friends. Yeah, we had, we had some good friends in Panama. The, uh, the Chicolanes, uh, it was... Uh, uh, Anna and uh, Manuel Ciccolani were good friends. What did Manuel do? Uh, I don't know what kind of business he was in. Then how was but, it that uh, you knew him Him and Anna? Well, uh, I worked with Anna in the office. Ah, okay. And, 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 uh, okay. and uh, Sam McGinnis, I also worked with him in the office there. Okay. And they, he, he was a good friend. Okay. And... Uh, uh, and you mentioned Matt and Betty Monson Matsunaga, Matt, Matt and Betty Matsunaga. Yeah. Uh, they, were, they were good friends of ours. Uh, Matt has now passed away, and I think Betty's living in Georgia somewhere. Okay. Do you remember what Matt, Matt did? Uh, he worked in the office there with, with me also. Okay. Yeah. So Mo most of the friends we had in Panama, you know, were worked with us and uh, worked yeah. with me in the, in the office there. Okay, so then you came to Gus Shores, and of course, everybody in the choir at, at St. Andrew, and uh, of the ones that were in the choir to begin with, mm -hmm. were your, are your very, very special friends. There's no yeah. way we could talk about all of them. Yeah. Um, and in the same light, we would mention Pastor Robert Warren and his wife, mm -hmm. Pat. Mm -hmm. um, they were good friends. Uh, and uh, and then also the friends on the street where we lived in uh, Gulf Shores b before I moved out to the retirement facility uh, on uh, Laurel Point Lane. There was uh, Scott and Sharon Ahola. Yeah. What and, did Scott do? You remember? Uh, he's got he's got a business up north somewhere, and and it's uh, I, I think it's uh, well, I really don't know. Okay. What what he does, but anyway, he he works from home here, okay. and occasionally makes a trip back and forth back up to to north. All right. And Tom and Kathy. And uh, Tom and Kathy, and and I don't recall that last name, but they are. They they live next door, All right. and uh, the uh, uh, the Bumans lived across the street, and both of them are now passed away. But they they were good friends, and uh, uh, Lorraine Gaddy, who's a real estate agent here in Gulf Shores, lived next door to the Bumans across the street. So, and then. Uh, Next door to them was uh, was uh, the uh, Jones, uh, Dick oh. and Dick and Brenda Jones. Right. Uh, you had mentioned them earlier. What what did Dick do? I don't know what kind of business he's in. He may be just retired. Okay. All right. So it looks like your 
your friends in Gulf Shores were spread out in more situations than anywhere yeah, else. You right. Had church yeah. and choir and then neighbors and right. professional friends. And Okay. David, I want to talk a minute about your churches because mm. I know that your Christian <clears throat> life was always important to both you and Anne. Mm -hmm. So... I'm just going to mention some churches that I think were significant in your life, and you can you can stop me at any time if you want to break in. But you were raised in the United Methodist Church of Starkville. That's correct. And I think that Anne was also she was just younger than you. Yes, the same um, church. Mm -hmm. And I believe that you told me earlier that that that's where you first. Well, the first time you sang in choir was in the fourth grade, but later on when you were maybe high school, you sang in the choir at, at the United Methodist Church of Starkville. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. And then after after you got engaged and you got married, you were married in, in, in that church. That must have been really special, both you and her, growing that's up in that church. That's correct. Do you remember the name of the pastor that performed the service? Oh, uh, our, our service, uh, Dr. Lott. Dr. Lott. L-O-T-T. -T. Okay. He's the one that married us. All right. And then for a short period of time, you attended the United Methodist Church in Vicksburg. Mm -hmm. And for the purposes of whoever might be listening to this video, we don't know the specific name of the Methodist Church in these cities. Mm. So we're just gonna to refer to them generally, usually as just the United Methodist Church. That's right. But it was usually the, the main one. So y'all attended the United Methodist Church in Vicksburg. Mm -hmm. And then even when you went overseas to Kealua, Hawaii, you attended the United Methodist Church there. Mm -hmm. And Anything you want to say about the service in that church, what that was like? I don't re recall too much about that church, uh, uh, the one in Hawaii. Uh, okay. All right. So you weren't there, there too long, and you moved to Nashville, and you went to a Methodist church in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And then you moved overseas again to Okinawa, mm -hmm. and you you were, went to church service at the military Chapel, yeah, military the, chapel, right? They yeah. had no choir there, so I didn't didn't sing in the choir there. So you've sang in all of these choirs in these churches that I mentioned. Yes, even the one in Hawaii. Uh, uh, yes. Okay, that's a great bit of information that I didn't quite understand. So, so in other words, not only in Starkville but in Vicksburg, Kilua, Hawaii, you sang in the Methodist church there and in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And also, when we lived in uh, Stone Mountain. Right, that's coming coming up next. Uh, after the military chapel in Okinawa, then you moved to Stone Mountain, and you went to St. Timothy United Methodist. That's right. Okay. Is is there anything you want to mention about that church or that choir? Well, that was, uh, that was a great church. Uh, and I did sing in the choir there. And, and also, in... When we lived in uh, in Stone Mountain, I sang in the Decatur Civic Chorus, which is uh, which was uh, a, a nice a, a big chorus in uh, Decatur, Georgia, uh, which is close by uh, Stone Mountain. Right. And uh, in that in that act in that particular group, uh, we 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 traveled to many places. Uh, Mexico City and uh, places all over make performing. Well, now that brings up another part of your life that I, I didn't know anything about, but that's very, very interesting and very relevant. Mm -hmm. um, in that time, I guess that was the, I don't know, the late 80s or early 90s, I know that Stone Mountain and Decatur were uh, not far from Atlanta. That's right. Almost suburbs. Yeah. And they were big uh, urban areas. Mm -hmm. And I know that in a choir uh, 
of that prominence, uh, it took a, you had to be a real good singer to even be invited to join that choir. Do you remember the circumstances of how you joined? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember going there the first time and, uh, and, uh, singing, uh, I, I, they they just said they just said come on in and 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 I, I noticed when uh, when I went in to to sing they 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 they, they had a choir a member uh, that had been there a long time uh, came over and sat beside me while we did that and then and then after we'd done two or three songs he got up and went and talked to the director I, I guess they, <laughs> I guess he was giving her a report. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was able to stay. I, I'm seeing the pieces fall together, but uh, we still have to probably surmise a little bit that how you hopped from, <clears throat> excuse me, from St. Timothy to to that church. And I'm willing to bet that somebody at St. Timothy, perhaps your choir director there, uh, put a recommendation in for you. Uh, uh, yeah, there was there was someone in the choir that that uh, ah. recommended that uh, that I go and sing at the Decatur Civic Chorus. Okay, all right. Then that was really quite an honor, because that particular choir probably received auditions, we'll say, from people all over the Atlanta area. Mm -hmm. So, you remember going to Mexico City and what were a couple of the others? Yes, we we went we went to Mexico City on a, a tour and. Okay. And, and, and they went. They went all over the world. They went. They wow. they they did tours in in Europe. But uh, I don't. I, I wasn't with them when they went to Europe. I don't think. Did you sing any solos for that choir? Mm -hmm. No. The Decatur Civic Chorus uh, is is mostly. Uh, it's all choral music. It, they didn't have any. They didn't have any solo music. Okay. It's all, all choir, all choral music. Okay, so it wasn't all religious music either then? Mm -mm, no, it wasn't, wasn't any religious music at all. Well, some, you know. Right. Occasionally we, we do a, a religious song, but uh, mostly it was, uh, uh, at, at, the, at the Civic Chorus, it was mostly just other non-religious non type music. Right, right. You, that would have been the kind of chorus that would sometimes have sung with orchestras, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a big deal. I know you really enjoyed that. Um, so then, after Saint Timothy, you moved to Panama, and you you and Ann attended a military base church there, and then finally you came back to Gulf Shores, and you immediately sought out the Methodist Church in Gulf Shores, um, and. You sang in the choir there. Um, I think you probably were only there for a couple of years. And then sort of just give a quick summary of what happened from that point on. We came to Gulf Shores and uh, we, when we first came here, we were in the, in the United Methodist Church of Gulf Shores. And then very shortly after that, we, uh, uh, we, we uh, a group of people from the Methodist Church and uh, and particularly the choir uh, moved out of the out of the church and uh, started uh, Saint Saint Timothy uh, Saint Andrew by the Sea. Right, but let me let me interrupt if, mm -hmm. if you will, please. And there's a little more detail to that. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that there was a. Uh, beach service going on at that time from a Baptist church in Foley, if I have heard this correctly. And it seems like that y'all first joined in with them, and then at some point you split to have your own service on the beach? Well, uh, we, we had a few services on the beach, and then, and then we uh, moved to a trailer in uh, that was here where, yeah, where the church is located now. There was a trailer here. There wasn't a church here at that time. It was just a, a lot. 
or they had a trailer on it. Okay, well, let's go back to the beach just a moment. I have a question about that. Did you, I know you had church services, so did you have singing on Gulf Shores Beach also? Did we have singing? Did you sing? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you had a service, you would have... Well, we would sing, you know, a hymn. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. And I guess what I'm getting at, David, is that most of most of the people in that group were former members of the choir That's right. at United Methodist. So it would have been a singing service, quite a bit of gospel music mm -hmm. involved, I imagine. I guess, yeah. Okay, so then you moved on to uh, the trailers when you, and then you went through two or three different moves within that location. Mm -hmm. And at, at some point, I, I guess from the very start, Joan Han was the director of the choir at St. Andrew. That's right. And so she had a good solid core of people to work with. Um, this is something that I think I was lost out. The information on this was got past me that Joan actually had all these great voices from United Methodist Church of Gulf Shores. Mm -hmm. So that tells a lot of the story because now in the current time is 2023 and St. Andrew has a, a choir with uh, typically about 20, 24, 25 people in it. Yeah, well, we have about, we have a lot more members than that, but a lot of them are snowbirds and uh, not here all the time. And then we have right. some that... Uh, that are not not as active as others, but yeah, normally there's around twenty to twenty five right. people. But what is amazing is that a group that small can make music as beautiful as we hear in our church every Sunday. Well, every thank Sunday. you, <laughs> absolutely, and um, it's a compliment not just to you but to Roger Jones and Joan Han and everybody else in that group. It's it, it is extraordinary. Okay, so. Seems like there was something else about the choir. Uh, yeah, they call on a guy from from that choir to sing uh, just a closer walk with thee every now and then. Don't they? <laughs> hey, yeah, <laughs> they do. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll have a clip of that in your in your biography. Anything else you'd like to say about the churches? Mm, no, that's about it. That. Uh... Uh, I really enjoy being in the choir here, and uh, and uh, the camaraderie with the with the choir members and the people. It's it's very important, as important as the songs that we sing. When we lived in Stone Mountain, Georgia, Ann was a member of the Stone Mountain Woman's Club. This club is very active and supports uh, civic activities and charities both stateside and over overseas. The club has an annual horse show, which uh, attracts participants and visitors all over the state. And the club members serve barbecue and Brunswick stew at the event as a fundraiser. Ann held the position of chairman of the International Affairs Committee within the club, which supports overseas charity, charitable causes. The club was actively involved when Atlanta was the host of the Olympics. And when Ann was recognized for her accomplishments as one of the club meetings, I wrote a tongue-in-cheek poem, which was read at the meeting. It was called A Husband's Viewpoint. I've always known that life was full of obstacles and woes. I've learned to live with sickness, death, and taxes, heaven knows. I've taken all these things in stride, the problems and the strife. One thing I didn't count on was a woman's club and wife.
Come home from work, the stove is cold, the dirty clothes still there. The suit I needed clean today still laying on the chair. Where's Mama, son? I asked my boy. This house a total mess. Why, well, all the sheets are missing. We've been burglarized, I guess. No, Mama stripped down all the beds and took the sheets away. Some pygmies in the jungle need some bandages today. Why, every pair of pants I own is cut in little squares. They need some quilts in Africa, my better half declares. I showed up at the office in my skivvy shorts and tie. My secretary giggles and the clerks give me the eye. It's freezing cold, I'm shaking, and my knees are turning blue. My boss man would have fired me, but his wife is clubbing too. I told him what had happened, and he said he did believe. I noticed that the coat he wore was missing half a sleeve. When I got home the other day, the FBI was there. They got a tip from neighbors, but I really didn't care. They booked me on a drug charge, and they thought I was insane. Three bar garbage bags of unused pill containers is easy to explain. Those sacks and sacks of empty pill containers on the chair... But I'll pull through, I always do, just one more cross to bear. A man sure needs a loving wife to help him when he's ill, to soothe and comfort, mop his brow, and help him take his pill. When influenza strikes you and your life's not worth a dime, but God be with you, brother, if it hits at horse show time. You'll lay there in an empty house in pain and deep despair, while barbecue and Brunswick stew get all the tender care. You'll learn to not ask questions when she waves and drives away and says she's off to Forsyth for some clubbing thing that day. Stays overnight, then drags back home all bleary-eyed and down. Now, who believe a lie like that? She must be running around. She told me that she's in charge of international affairs. I'm afraid to ask just what that means and how it all compares. We must have double standards. It was murder by degrees. She damn near killed me when I tried to have one overseas. But I'll get by, I always do. Some days are fine, some not. When she's a clubbing woman, you must put up with a lot. I know that when my life is through and when I pass away, They'll have to set the funeral so it's not on clubbing day. And when St. Peter at the gate says, Come to me, my son, I'll check you in the book of life to see how you have done. He runs his finger down the page and sadly shakes his head. Your wife was in the woman's club for all those years, he said. She didn't cook, she didn't sew, she didn't make the bed. She spent all her time on projects for the woman's club instead. Olympics was the master theme, a cause to set the pace. She hid your other t-shirts so you'd advertise the race. Come right on through those pearly gates. There's nothing left to tell. Your wife is in the woman's club. You've done your time in hell. This was her 75th birthday. But you wrote it before then, right? Uh, yes, I wrote it before then and read it to her on her 75th birthday. 
Okay. Oh, happy birthday, Annie, dear. This one's a special day. You've hit a brand new milestone, so I must confess and say that looking back over all the years that brought you to this place, the reconciliation puts a smile upon my face. For me, it all began in church. A lampshade hat, I see. Is that a girl beneath that hat? Now, who could that girl be? I'm just back from the service, and I've been away a while. I ask around and find her name, and all my buddies smile, and they tell me that her name is Ann. Now, that's a pretty name. And after introductions, we began the dating game. <laughs> You're 18 then and just a kid, and I was 24. I drove way out on New Light Road and knocked upon your door. Your little brother asked me in and told me that he thought that castorating pigs was great. <laughs> oh, what a happy thought. <laughs> now, those were trying times for you. You left your home in town. Your family moved out to the farm. Your spirits then were down. You had no phone, no car, no hope. You really were depressed. And separation from your friends was hard to take at best. But we began the dating to date and then you seemed to settle in. I know when first I met you that a love life would begin. You had some apprehensions when we had a flat and then you opened up the trunk to change the tire and you looked in. You saw a folded blanket and a cooler full of beer, <laughs> a tuned up ukulele, and you said, what's all this here? I made some lame excuses, but the truth could not be shared. In case a guy gets lucky, he must always be prepared. <laughs> Forget it, Dave. This girl is nice, and you will, you'll not score tonight. <laughs> so change the tire and close the trunk and keep your actions right. <laughs> we dated, and we fell in love and set a wedding date. We had to get approval. At, at that age, you're still jail bait. <laughs> we married then, and... The wedding night, and what more could be said, the unexpected happened in the darkness of our bed. <laughs> I can't believe the thoughts I had when bugs crawled in your ear. <laughs> I said, be quiet and concentrate on what we're doing here. We flipped the light and realized that that was not the norm. We had to put aside our play and fight a termite storm. And in Columbus, I tried hard to make insurance sell until your dad got sick and left Farm Bureau for a spell. So we moved back to Starkville and you really helped your dad. You were the youngest agent that Farm Bureau ever had. You brought a child into the world, our first. Oh, she was sweet. Our darling baby Debbie what a blessing and a treat. Your dad returned and we moved on. Yes, Vicksburg was the town. The Corps of Engineers was just the place to settle down. With Connie Greer and Homer and the Cowards up the way and Boots and Buster Bass were there. They're with us still today. And that and there our second child was born, a boy this time, and wow. We named him David Jr., and he's so successful now. There's more about him later on, but blessings from above with Sally and those two sweet girls who fill our hearts with love. In Vicksburg town, we stayed a while till opportunity gave us a chance to see the world. We moved to Waikiki. 
Hawaii was the real nice, real neat place. You loved it living there and made close friends and got two cats that really were a pair. The cats are gone, but pleasant thoughts remain. Oh, how we're blessed. Our memories of friends and pets whose souls are now at rest. And then after four years that, out there, a chance to, eat, to even more, to Nashville, Tennessee for a promotion with the Corps. I knew that every day you spent in that place was a pain, but we acquired some friendships there that to this day remain. Though Harold's gone and we've moved on, dear Janie still is dear, and Jan from our Hawaii days, though Jim's no longer here. And then to Okinawa with our kids and cats we went to broaden our horizons with a two-year Far East stint. The Townleys were our neighbors there and friends we valued much. We had a lot in common with our kids and jobs and such. Our tour in Okinawa gave us opportunity to visit, more, visit many places we had always hoped to see. From Taiwan to the Philippines, from Hong Kong to Japan, a view of different cultures and the beauty of the land. We took a trip to Thailand just you, the kids, and me. We met a guy aboard the flight, as nice as, as nice as he could be. He told us that the Swan Lake was a place where we should stay. The cab driver expressed concern, but took us anyway. And it was after we checked in, we realized our fate. We were, <laughs> that we were in a whorehouse. <laughs> <laughs> but but to leave it but to leave it was too late. We stayed the night. The food was great. We left at morning's light. Our son can brag to all his friends just where he spent the night. <laughs> and then back in America, Stone Mountain was the town. We lived on Balbrasheila Drive and there we settled down. In fact, we stayed there many years and raised a family. St. Timothy became the source of friends for you and me. And we were there, and it was there that we acquired our next beloved pet. His name was Woogin, and became the best cat ever yet. Of all the pets we've ever had, I think he topped the list was almost human in response in, to love and tenderness. He went with us to Panama and there he passed away. I still can feel the pain I had on that sad mournful day. I think that you were 55 when Woogin left us there. We lost a family member and that loss was hard to bear. But let's go back before I went to Panama that day. I know that our retirement would be based on average pay. The big pay raise in Panama was surely on our side. We could retire with much more dough and life until we die, for life until we died. So I went first from time, though times were tough, and after I got there, a war broke out to overthrow the dictator down there. But then you joined me after that, and we had so much fun. We made close friends and lived with joy those seasons in the sun. Now Matt is gone, but Betty still is close to us this day. Changing times are hard to take, but life is just that way. Now looking back over all the years and choices we have made, 
I think that Panama was just the best place that we stayed. Big Sam, the Chicolanes, and the others that we knew will always bring fond memories to us wherever we go. <coughs> then we retired in Panama and came, here back, came back here to stay and settled down in Gulf Shores where we are this very day. This year, was, the year was 1996 and you were 56. A lot has happened since that time, a sad and happy mix. We lost our daughter, Debbie, and the pain was hard to bear. But she gave us grandchildren that were such a wholesome pair. There's Jennifer and Christopher. We love them very much. We raised them like they were our own, a second batch as such. <laughs> They've all moved out and on their own, it's hard to let them go, but they must make their own, life, own footprint on life as we all know. And Daddy left us with three cats. Debbie left us with three cats that are with us still today, Big Tippy, Goofy Grendel, and of course, Sweet Callie Mae. Then Christopher came back one day and brought a big surprise. You fell in love with Knuckles when you looked into those eyes. That puppy changed your life around, and I can truly say he's helped to fill the vacant spot that Wiggin left that day. But up there in Decula is the family we adore. Successful mom, successful dad. Now who could ask for more? Sweet Sally is the perfect mom. I just don't know how she can work, but still can find the time to raise a family. Two children, smart and loving, who are angels in our mind. Sweet Jordan is the oldest. Then there's Reagan close behind. Those girls are growing up so fast. We want them both to know that in our thought, they're in our thoughts and in our prayers. And oh, we love them so. So now it's time to ponder in the autumn of your years, reflecting Reflect upon the happy times and put aside your fears and make that bucket list of things to do before you go. To celebrate 70, you parasail, so. Hmm. What will you do in future years? Put all your fears aside? A motorcycle trip somewhere? A helicopter ride? <laughs> Or fly with the Blue Angels? Would your friends think you're insane? Or maybe running with the bulls in Pamplona, Spain? One thing for sure, regardless of how crazy it may be, I'll be there with a change of clothes in case it makes you pee. But back to birthday time, sweetheart. I hope your day's the best. And many happy years to come with joy and happiness. Anne passed away on uh, May the 26th of 2021. We had been married for 62 years. Her loss was overwhelming and the sadness remains to this day. Following her death, I penned a few words that I believe captures how we should deal with death and structure our thoughts when loved ones pass away. It's human nature to hold on to everything we love, yet life is temporary, and we lose the presence of the ones we love when that time comes and loved ones pass away. A sadness fills our hearts and minds, and sorrow fills our day. It's hard to face the fact that life, that every living thing, 
will someday also pass away, the sorrow it will bring. We'll wish that those now gone were back, were here with us to stay. The ones we love when that time comes, their loved ones pass away. Yet also in the human mind is still another part. Fond memories can soothe the pain that lingers in our heart. So focus on fond memories of those we lost today. The ones we love when that time comes and loved ones pass away. The happy times, the laughter, and the thoughts that we can name of former times when they were here and all was back the same. Our Lord and Savior promises he'll be with them today. The ones we love when that time comes and loved ones pass away. Time has a way of smoothing out the wrinkles in our life and ease the pain and suffering we get from hurt and strife. Just know that heaven is a place, and they are on the way. The ones we love when that time comes, and loved ones pass away. One of the hardest things we have to deal with while we're on this earth is the fact that all life is temporary. Yet in our minds, we always want to keep the ones we love forever. This is truly life's paradox. The greatest paradox on earth that we live with today is death and how acceptance when a loved one fades away. It's true that since the world began, all things that live will die. Yet when it happens near to us, we mourn and question why. The reason is that while we're here, God gave us from above a heart, though temporary, we can fill it full of love and cherish those that are a part of our lives here. And so we want to hold them near to us and never let them go. It's true with family, friends, and pets, yet life's just not that way. Everything that lives and breathes will have a final day. So hold them close and share your love with those while they are here, and let them know you love them all, the ones you hold so dear. For this will make the life for them a better place to be, and make your heart much stronger, filled with love and purity. And when they're gone, reflect upon the good times that you had, and cast away the memories of the things that made you sad. The love for them will stay with you until you too will go. So live life to its fullest, and remember this also. Show empathy and gratitude be loving and be kind, so you become good memories for the ones you leave behind. When I retired in 1995, we moved to Gulf Shores. Ever since I was in high school, I have sung in church choirs wherever we've lived. So upon our arrival here, I joined the church choir. Choral involvement is more than just singing songs. It's the building of friendships with other singers and the feeling of satisfaction when the united effort of the choral group relates a beautiful message to the congregation in tune and meter. Yes, an elated feeling comes to me when the choir begins to sing. Among the things I've always loved since I was very young, that peaceful, quiet reflection on the song the choir has sung, that moment of first silence as the last chord fades away, the comfort of that moment brings a brightness to my day. And in anticipation of that feeling songs can bring, I'm looking forward to it when the choir begins to sing. 
There's also something special in belonging to the choir. When I'm participating, then I'm in my finest hour. The art of making others feel the music in their soul by adding tune and meter to a message makes it whole. Yet on the new dimension, more than any other thing, I feel a team involvement when the choir begins to sing. Although the music that we sing is why the choir exists, the friendship interaction is still high up on the list. The camaraderie with friends we share makes singing fun. We joke while we're rehearsing songs, yet still we get it done. And yet beyond the joking, there's a feeling lingering, a closeness with each other when the choir begins to sing. I know that age will take its toll, and some day I won't be among my group of friends that sing those anthems tenderly. I hope the friendships will remain. The strongest bonds for me are with my choral family at St. Andrew by the Sea. And when the angels take me up to stand before my king, I hope that I can join them when the choir begins to sing. When my feeble life is over,